Well, here we are on uh, what we uh, call Easter or Resurrection Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and all of the things that that means for us because uh, it is applied to us and through him we have eternal life. And that's an amazing thing. And I don't know why you came this morning. Probably have various reasons. Uh, but I want you to know uh, right up front that God is reaching out to you this morning. He's giving you an invitation to step into his kingdom and become citizens of the kingdom of heaven to have eternal life which begins the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you'll be able to live the rest of your life knowing that regardless of what comes your way even to the point of death that will be for you but a beginning of an eternity with Christ and therefore you can live your life a lot more positively there will be things that come into our lives uh, that we don't like things that cause us sadness, things that upset us, but we will be able to cope with those things knowing that there is something much more, much greater in store for us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Have you ever noticed in the English language how certain phrases creep in and the first few times you hear them they're, they, they seem pretty good, but after the umpteenth millionth time you wish people would strike them from the vocabulary? Uh, one of those phrases, uh, for instance, uh, that has been suggested to be struck from our vocabulary is, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's so overused, and especially if, if you watch any of the, the Alphabet Soup news networks, it's always at the end of the day. And so that one could go. Well, the one I would like to see struck has been uh, taken over, I don't know about all salesmen, but it's been taken over uh, pretty much by Christian salesmen. I get a lot of solicitations for various things from them. And, and just the other day I got one that sort of added a new dimension to it. Uh, and it, it said, Dear Daryl, a friend of mine asked me to reach out to you. Well, all he wanted to do was sell me something. He didn't want to reach out to me for my benefit at all but for his benefit. You know, that's what we say now. Well, I just want to reach out to you. But uh, it's, it's usually reaching out like this. You know. God's a little different, though. He's reaching out to you today, but he's reaching out to you to offer you eternal life. Totally free. Totally by his grace. Totally motivated by his love. No matter what you've done, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, God says, I'm going to give you eternal life. All you have to do is accept it. So as we uh, talk about his resurrection and some of the things that happened there, think about that. Think about the fact that the great God who literally spoke this universe into existence is personally reaching out to you this morning and offering you the greatest gift of all time, the gift of eternal life. Well, as we, we think about the resurrection, uh, we, we can't start there. We have to start with the crucifixion. And the crucifixion had to happen before the resurrection. When we think about the crucifixion, uh, we think about Christ's death, don't we? We talked about that last week, uh, how he gave his life a sacrifice for us. But you know, his death was never the point. His death really changed very little. A few things happened, the sky was darkened and, and so on and so forth, the, the curtain in the temple was, was torn, uh, but that was about it. They took him down from the cross, they put him in a tomb, they buried him, and if he would have stayed in that tomb, that would have been the end of it. Just another persuasive preacher that wandered through the land selling religion. But the good news, the great news, the fantastic news is he didn't stay in that grave. He didn't stay in that tomb. On the third day, on Sunday morning, he rose out of that tomb. Now of all the religions in the world, of all the ones that claim to uh, have great teachers and great leaders and all that, and some of them were very kind and very good and some of them were not, but none of them claims to have risen from the dead. 
except Jesus Christ. Because He's the only one who did. And He's the only one that can offer us eternal life. His death changed practically nothing, but His life, His, his resurrection changed everything. It's now possible for people, flawed, frail, messed up people like you and me, to enter boldly into God's presence, to call Him Father, to have a familial relationship with God Himself. What an amazing thing that is. He is perfect. We are not to varying degrees. Some of us are better than others. Some of us are worse than others. But He is perfect. And yet He says, I want to have a relationship with you. Why on earth he would want to have a relationship with me is beyond me. But he does. So, the invitation still stands. Come unto me. The invitation will stand as long as time endures. But here's the problem. We don't know how long that is. Time could come to an end before I finish speaking. And by the time I'm finished, maybe some of you will be wishing it would. <laughs> or it may go on for another 4,000 years. We don't know. And that's the point. We don't know. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, take this opportunity. Become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven now. Because we may have 4,000 years. Or not. God is reaching out to you. Accept his offer. Make the journey from the cross to the resurrected Jesus and change your life forever. Now you may say, well, where do I begin? You want me to go on a journey? Well, the journey has to begin at the same place for every one of us. And that journey begins at the cross. We read in Luke chapter 23, Verses 44 through 49. It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. They're all gathered at the cross. They all witnessed Christ's death. You see, if we are going to live for Jesus, we first have to die for Jesus. If we're going to live for him, we first have to die for him. That's not an easy thing to do, is it? Because we're all selfish creatures. And again, there are degrees. Some of us are less selfish than others. You know? By the way, I'm an only child. <laughs> I know all about being selfish. My poor wife, she loves me anyway. But... Uh, you know, there's degrees. We can always find somebody better or worse than us. But it's hard to die to self. It's hard to set our wants, our desires, our thinking aside and subordinate it to the will of God. We talked a little bit about that last week when Jesus was in the garden praying to the Father that he wouldn't have to go to the cross. And yet he said, not my will but thine be done. It's a difficult thing to do. But Jesus says this, whoever would save his life must lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Just as Jesus died for us, we must die for him. But there is a little difference. Jesus died physically for us on the cross. He asked us to die 
spiritually for him to die to ourselves, to our desire. You know, Paul tells us in Romans, he wants us to present our bodies as living sacrifices. He doesn't ask us to quit living. He doesn't ask us to give up life. Uh, sometimes folks think, well, if you become a Christian, uh, you've got to quit having fun, you've got to quit doing this, quit doing that. Well, Christianity is not about quitting anything. Christianity is about beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ. Then the Holy Spirit will work it out with you. He may want you to quit something. He may not. He may want you to start something. It might be different for each and every one of us, but it all begins at the cross with that dying to self and subjugating our will to God's will. God deals with us as individuals. And therefore, our cross experience may vary. If you talk to Christians and ask them uh, when they came uh, to know Jesus Christ, you'll get all kinds of answers. You'll get answers from, uh, that range from, well, I don't know, I just kind of always believed since I was a baby. And you, then you'll get some really fantastic far out stories about uh, being at the point of death or being in this crisis or that crisis. And they're all valid, you see, because God deals with us as individuals. If you look in the New Testament, you have the conversion of, of Saul, or known as Paul afterwards. And if you're, if you're not, not familiar with the story, the thing is Saul was uh, persecuting Christians. He was uh, in charge of rounding them up and, and having them thrown into prison, maybe having them killed. And he was on his way to gather up some Christians. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, this big lightning bolt from heaven and knocks him off his horse and he hears this voice from God says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, that's a pretty good experience. I think I'd become a Christian too, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. But then you read on a little further and you come to Timothy. And Timothy's one of those guys, Scripture says, well, Timothy, you, you always believe from childhood because of your grandmother Eunice. See, both of those guys are in the New Testament. Both of them hold places of renown in the New Testament. And yet their experience was so different. I'll give you an example from the 16th century, the time of the Reformation, a guy named Martin Luther. He's a, a, a young college student, he's studying law, and he's on his way home one night. It's in Germany, he's in the forest, a lot of uh, bad weather in Germany, and a lightning storm and a thunderstorm. Now, he didn't get knocked off his horse, but he was afraid he was about to, so he says, God, if you'll get me home safe, I'll quit law school and go to seminary. Well, the storm stopped. He got home safe. I'd become a Christian too. But there was another figure in the Reformation, a guy by the name of John Calvin. He wrote all kinds of things. One of the greatest theologians ever. He never wrote a word about his conversion because he was a very quiet man and he didn't like to draw attention to himself. We don't know anything about how Calvin became a Christian, but we certainly know and thank God that he did. So contrast. So your experience may be just quietly saying, okay God, I surrender. Or you may have some major crisis going on and, and he may intervene in it. Either way is valid because God deals with us as individuals. Well, okay, we all start at the, path, at the cross, but then our journeys take different paths away from the cross. God calls us into different things in different ways in different places. But though we may take different paths away from the cross, we may do a, a myriad of different things, there is still only one way and to get to our destination, and that is through Jesus Christ. What does he say in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. 
So I, I like to think of it as if you can kind of visualize you've got a cross here and all these people coming to the cross and all funnels down to the cross and then afterwards it goes out and they spread out into all the world and become all sorts of different things. Doctors, uh, they tell me even some Christians can be lawyers. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I guess it's possible. With God, all things are possible. Michael beat me up after the service. Right? <laughs> different paths to the cross and different paths from the cross. But they all go through Jesus. And again, regardless of why you think you came here this Easter, you are here by divine appointment. God has given you this time, this opportunity to come to grips with either his calling you into his kingdom or if you're already there into submitting your will to his don't miss what God wants to do in your life today now perhaps you're thinking well I didn't come here at all to meet God I came here because my friends talked me into it or because it's a thing to do on Easter or because I belong to Parkside Church and this is where I go every Sunday no that's why we think we come. We know we have come by divine appointment to meet with God. He wants this to be your resurrection day. Think about that. Your resurrection day as opposed to just the resurrection day. That's tremendous. Let's see how God reached out to some on that first resurrection day. The first group he reaches out to, as seems to be a pattern, he reaches out to the women. Now, it's interesting in that culture, the women didn't have a very high standing as far as being important. We, we live in an egalitarian society, as it should be, and women are equal to men. They do anything we can do, and et cetera, et cetera. And we respect them for that. But in those days, it was different. In those days, you wouldn't go to a woman if you had opportunity to go to the man because the man told the woman what to do. See? Funny how that's flipped around, isn't it? <laughs> no. But God often reaches out to the women first, and he does that here. You know what I think he did that? Obviously, he did it to make a point that they were equal okay, to the men. But I think he might have done that too because it's been just my, this is just my experience now. I don't think this is grand theology because it could be wrong. But in my experience of many, many years, women are a little quicker on the uptake when it comes to spiritual things. Uh, they have, seem to have softer hearts and maybe sharper minds when it comes to the things of God. Did you ever notice with couples, it's, it's off, it, uh, non-Christian couples, it's almost always the woman who comes first to Christ. And then she leads her husband. And I don't know, like I say, that's just anecdotal evidence. But I think it might be accurate. Anyway, let's read about these women. Women. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. But the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Interesting. These women, like many people today, were looking in the wrong place. They had good intentions. They loved the Lord Jesus. They were going there to do a good thing. They wanted to make sure his body was properly cared for uh, and so on and so forth. But they were looking in the wrong place. They were looking in an empty tomb for a living God. We see that today over and over again. We see good people with good motives looking in all the wrong places for Jesus Christ. And sometimes they even look in places we call religion. Sometimes they even look in places we call evangelical churches. And sadly, sometimes he's not there. Hmm. 
Hmm. Look what happens. Pick it up here in verse 4. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Wow. He has risen. <coughs> and they remembered this, his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Notice once they understood what they did. They didn't sit down and have a celebration among themselves, but they immediately went and told others about the risen Christ. You see, when we come to Christ, when we come to the cross, Yes, in one sense we leave as victors, as uh, princes and princesses in his kingdom, so to speak. But we also leave as servants of the great living God. You know, too often I, I think Christianity is presented as, well, just accept Jesus and he'll be your kind of magic lamp from now on. You pray and he'll answer and he'll do this and he'll do that. When it really should be, when you accept Jesus, you become His servant. You subjugate your will to His will. And His will is what? Go into all the world and tell about me. And that's exactly what these women did. No longer timid, cowering women. Remember at the cross, they, they wouldn't even get up close. They were standing back. They were afraid. They were frightened. Not anymore. The first thing they do is make a beeline for the, the, the most influential men they know, the apostles, and tell them the good news, that Jesus has risen. Well, let's look at a couple of guys, see what their situation is. Again, in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 17. That very day... Two men were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened, about the crucifixion of Christ. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking and said, one of them named Cleophas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, God and all the people, and now our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Now think about this. Here we have two men, obviously, who had been followers of Jesus to one extent or another. And Jesus had totally failed them. They had thrown in their lot with him hoping he was going to be the redeemer of Israel. He was going to retake the kingdom, boot the Romans out, and set up the kingdom of God. Now, these guys were all in. You didn't just put your toe in the water. They risked everything they had, their lives, their fortunes, if they had any, to follow this Jesus. And where did he take them? to a total dead end as far as they were concerned. He promised them life and he himself died. You remember what they said to him when he was on the cross, so many of them? If you're God, save yourself, come down from that cross. And he could not. <laughs> well, we know he did not, but they figured he could not because they didn't have the whole story as we do. So think about it. They're walking along, they're getting out of town, they're going to Emmaus, and they're grumbling among themselves. 
you know, how could we have been such fools? We bought this guy's story. Just another false messiah. They're so dejected that Jesus shows up and walking right along with them and they're so focused on the problem they didn't see the solution that was right there beside them. Kind of like us sometimes, isn't it? We're so focused on the problem we can't see the solution. Now think about it. Let's switch gears a little bit. Think about it from Jesus' perspective. Now here he had walked among these guys and they had followed him and he had gone to the cross and died for them and now he shows up walking right beside them and they don't even recognize him. All they're doing is griping and complaining about what he did or didn't do. What would you have said to them if you were Jesus? Or if you were you? Let me rephrase that. Well, I might just rip them up. <laughs> you know, what's the matter with you turkeys? I endured the cross and you're complaining. I'm here, look! Hmm. Let's listen to what Jesus did. He asked them, and it's always interesting to me in Scripture, you ever notice how many times God or Je and Jesus ask questions? Well, they know the answer. They're not asking for the sake of information, but it's a good way to get us to think, isn't it? Sure. So he asked them a question. And he says to them, what, what's the conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleophas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know these things that happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all that, it is now the third day since things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women said, but they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, and they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures? Instead of berating them, instead of demeaning them, instead of hitting them over the head, he took the time to open the scriptures and explain them to them. To point out to them how he was the Christ. That's the way God deals with us most of the time. Now sometimes he hits us over the head to get our attention, those of us that are more hard-headed than others. But most of the time he simply speaks to our hearts, speaks to our minds, and helps us to understand. Much like us, these two men finally understand that it was Jesus who was walking with them all along. How many times have you said or heard it said, where was God when? And it's usually an indictment on God. This person is usually referring to something bad that happened. Well, where was God when? And that's where these two guys were. Well, where was God? He was right beside them. You see? It's like that 
poem called Footprints. You've probably all seen it one time or another. This guy's going along, he's having a dream, and he's looking back at his life, and here's these two sets of footprints, and it's supposed to be Jesus walking with him through his life, and then there's only one set of footprints. His life's really hard, and he says something to the effect of, well, how come you left me when it all got so hard? There's only one set of footprints. And of course, Christ's response is, that's when I carried you. You see? And we don't always recognize when he's carrying us. We think it's all about us and when it's really all about him. So these dejected, downhearted men after their encounter with the risen Lord do the same thing, interestingly, that the women did. Pick it up here in verse uh, 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road when he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those who were with him gathered together saying, The Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. You see, when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you can't just sit there. You get up and you do something for Jesus Christ. And that's what these two men did, just as the women did. Now what about this? He said he, he had an encounter with Simon. Well, we know that Simon is Peter, one and the same person. What about Peter? Well, if you are familiar with the crucifixion account, you would think that Peter, of all people, would certainly be ashamed of himself. You know what happened, of course. Peter denied even knowing Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. He said, I don't even know him. You'd think he would be ashamed of himself, that he would never show his face again. And yet Peter became the boldest of all the apostles. Who preaches the first sermon in the church age? You obviously know the answer. Peter, in Acts chapter 2. It's Peter who stands up at Pentecost when uh, the powers that be are accusing the people of being, being drunk and all that. And he stands up and he says, no. And he preaches the sermon. In Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, we see that Peter has been drugged uh, before the authorities. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, they're talking about Peter, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, and on he goes. This is the same guy that was afraid to even have his, himself associated with Jesus Christ. So you see, the resurrection makes all the difference in these people's lives. All of their lives were changed by their encounter with the risen Lord. And that's the business that Jesus is in. Changing lives. Resurrecting folks from spiritual death to spiritual life. The New Testament is plain. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. Our spiritual life is non-existent. There's nothing we can do. No more than a dead person buried under the ground can do to save themselves. But God intervenes and calls us out of that spiritual darkness into his marvelous light. Raising the dead to new life. And if you are here this morning, he wants to change your life also. He doesn't necessarily want to fix all your problems. Don't get me wrong. He may, though. We don't know. But I guarantee you what he will do. On the day you die, he will take you to be with him for eternity. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. It's the promise of eternal life. And maybe you, you're, you're here and you're a good person. Maybe you've been looking in all the wrong places. Maybe you've been disappointed. 
Maybe you've heard the, the pitch about Jesus is going to fix this and do this and do that for you. Well, he may, but I don't know that. And you don't either. The only thing I know for sure is to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In that, you will never be disappointed. For He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we all come to the Father through Him. You know, you may be the opposite of that good person. You may be like Peter. Maybe you just flat out rejected him. It's all right. He'll take you anyway. So I would just implore you, let this be the day that you allow Jesus Christ to truly take over your life. Because he really is reaching out to you. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you are God, Savior, King, Lord, Master, all of those things. Thank you that you rose from the dead. Thank you that you conquered sin in the grave. And thank you that you reach out to us and call us as individuals. You call us by name into your kingdom. And Lord, I would pray that if you are reaching out to people this morning that don't know you, that they will embrace you that they will respond positively. And we that do know you know that you're continually reaching out to us. And I would pray that your spirit would so fill us that we would truly be able to subjugate our wills to yours. Lord, it's something we need to do on a continual basis just because of our human nature. And I, as much as any, and probably more than most, struggle with that. So Lord, we, we need you we need your Holy Spirit to humble us so that we can carry out your will. So we can say, as you said to the Father, not our will but yours be done. And Lord, thank you that on the day that we leave this earth, we go immediately to be with you for eternity. What a wonderful promise that is. And now I ask that you would bless each and every person that came here this morning, Lord, that you would give us a, a great afternoon, a good week, with opportunity to tell others about you and bring us back next Sunday to worship you together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.